in a relay race, you're running, you have the exchange zone. And in that exchange zone, the, the, the runner's coming in there full speed. Well, I was at full speed. One thing I've learned, and I tell guys all the time, don't pass the baton when you're starting to slow down. Hmm, pass cool. the baton where you're still at full speed, where you still got a lot of run in you. That's when you pass it. You don't walk away from the game when you're worn out and injured. You know, you want to be at the top of your game when you pass the baton. So you got to hit the exchange zone at full speed. This is the L3 Leadership Podcast, episode number 206. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host. I hope you're having a great day. In today's episode, you'll hear my interview with a leadership legend, Coach Tom Mullins. If you're unfamiliar with Coach, let me just tell you a few things you need to know about him. He founded Christ Fellowship Church in West Palm Beach, Florida, and that church now has over 51,000 people attending on a weekly basis. He also successfully handed over the church to his son and daughter-in-law a few years ago, and since that time, the church has doubled in size, which is, is pretty crazy. Crazy. And we actually talk about how he transitioned the church to the next generation in the interview, and he has so much wisdom on this. You're going to love that part. Uh, before founding the church, he was a football coach at the college and high school level. He's been the past president of John Maxwell's organization, Equip. He's co-founded Place of Hope, a residential community of homes for neglected and abused children in Florida. And he's been married to his wife for over 50 years. He is an incredible leader, and I promise you, you will be fired up at this man's energy and what he's doing with his life in his 70s. But before we dive into the interview with Coach, just a brief announcement. If you are in ministry, you're a church leader or a church member, then I want to let you know about a conference you will not want to miss. My friends at Amplified Church and their leader, Lee Kreitzer, are hosting their annual Future Forward Conference here in Pittsburgh on October 2nd and 3rd. This year, they're having Kerry Newhoff come in as their keynote speaker. And if you don't know Kerry, you need to. He's one of the leading voices in the leadership space in the world today. Uh, he actually just came out with a new book called Didn't See It Coming. I just finished it this week. It is an absolute must read for every leader. So if you're listening to this, go and buy Kerry's book. And it'll obviously be available at the conference. I'm going to be there. I cannot wait. And I encourage you to come uh, to the conference as well. So if you want to learn more about the conference and register your team, go to Future for forwardchurches.com. With that said, let's dive right into the interview with Coach, and I'll be back at the end with a few announcements. Thank you, Coach, so much for being willing to do this interview. It's an honor. I've been following you for a long time, and why don't we just start off, for those who don't know you, uh, with you telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Mullins. Uh, I coach football for about 15 years. That's why I've been stuck with the uh, really the title of Coach. Most people call me Coach. Um, I, I went to school, uh, at Georgetown college, uh, played football there, graduated from there, got my master's degree there, uh, went into, uh, athletics, uh, coaching both on a high school and college level, became a college athletic director, uh, felt the call of God to ministry, uh, back in 1983. Can't believe it's been that long ago. Hmm. And, um, stepped and followed the Lord into ministry. And my wife and I stepped out by faith and planted a church called Christ Fellowship here in South Florida 35 years ago. I went back and got my doctorate degree from Liberty University uh, and Liberty Seminary. And uh, I'm currently pursuing my PhD in organizational leadership from Southeastern University. I've completed my coursework and I'm working on my dissertation as we do this podcast. That's why I, that's why I told, that's why I told, I told Doug, hey, we got to make this short, baby. I got a lot of work to do because I'm trying to graduate uh, this December and walk with my PhD in organizational leadership. So that's the short and skinny on uh, on Tom Mullins. Yeah, and so so over your journey, the church that you plan in now has over forty thousand people in attendance through multi multiple campuses. And I'm just curious, as people look at your journey, what do you wish people knew about your journey and what it took to get here uh, that they may not know? Well, I think with any journey like we've been on, uh, there's a lot to be said about just tenacity. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to have a commitment uh, to whatever that call and pursuit is in your life. And um, because the, the early years of Christ Fellowship, um, there wasn't much glamour. There wasn't much uh, uh, going on. I mean, it was a very small group of us just trying to be faithful, pursue the heart of the Lord. And, um, you know, it, there was, I think it was my testing time as well, 
But, you know, a great thing, playing football, you have to learn how to play through the pain. Um, when you're coaching, you got to learn how to have that, that tenacity that makes you really have grit and, and it develops and strengthens your character. And I look back on those early years and I think that that was a big part of it, just being staying committed, staying faithful. Um, whatever assignment you have, no matter how large or small it is, be faithful to that assignment. And, and I think there's a lot of, uh, my grandfather taught me that principle, Doug, that no matter what assignment you have, do it with all your heart. And, and do your best. I wrote a book one time called The Leadership Game, and it was how to really lead in, uh, like a coach would in, in your organization. And uh, I interviewed uh, national championship coaches, how they, it's kind of like the uh, from good to great model, you know, how, what, what's, how do you go from good to great with your championship thing? And one of the coaches I interviewed from uh, down at the University of Miami, he, he, he told me, he said, you know, the key is uh, bloom where you're planted. In other words, whatever, wherever you find yourself, do your best with what you have and, and who you're working with and, and try to add value. And I think that was probably the foundation for our journey and still is today. We, we want to be faithful for whatever assignment we have, do our best and add value to the people and to the team that's working with you. So you're obviously not at your finish line yet, but you've gone a lot farther than a lot of leaders have. I'm sure throughout your journey, you've seen a lot of leaders fall off or, or get off track of their race. And, and now it doesn't look like they're going to make it to their finish line. I'm just curious, what advice do you have and, and where do you see leaders get off track to where they fall off and, and get off course uh, and not make it to their finish line? And what would your encouragement be to young leaders to avoid those pitfalls? Well, I, I think a lot depends uh, on, in, in my world, it's, it's keeping your personal relationship with uh, your creator uh, fresh and vibrant, keeping that mission uh, simple and clear in front of you. And I think then having a team around you of accountability. I, I think it's important. I'm blessed with a great wife. Don and I have been married for 53 years. Uh, she's been my girlfriend for 57 years. Um, and, and, uh, I think, uh, that relationship strong and vibrant, we are together and unified in our mission. And I've always had great men, uh, around me. Um, and, and I've always had this sense of accountability. Um, I've been staying focused on that. And I think a part of the problem is as you grow or become quote, more successful in your organization, um, we have a tendency to be pulled out from many different directions. And I think being able to stay focused on mission uh, and, and realize the difference between good and best and always try to select the best and never compromise your core values. And those core values have to be there as guidelines for your life. And I think that's what protects your life. I think it's when you start compromising that. You know, and, and I've set these core values and parameters for my personal life, my professional life, my interaction in my professional life. Um, I've always told men, for instance, Doug, you know, you, be careful in everything you do. Be careful in all your associations. Um, and in my world, the church world, you know, I never have a meeting with a woman alone. I always have a covering. Uh, you never counsel someone alone of the opposite sex. I'm just saying, guard yourself against anything that even could look like something that's not right. And then do everything with integrity. You know, from the smallest aspects, guard your integrity in all things. And, and I think that's how you protect yourself and stay focused for the long haul. I love that. So over the course of growing your church, I'm just curious, were there one or two significant leadership uh, lessons that you learned that changed everything that were pivotal for you guys to go to where God wanted you to get? Yeah, I think there's several. And, um, you know, you, 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 you run into and encounter people that along your life that really help you grow in your leadership. And, 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 I, and I experienced that. Um, I think one of the lessons that I needed to transfer over from my coaching years was uh, in the early years, I tried to fit into a standard mold of the leadership model of most churches and most pastors. And then I realized, you know what, what am I doing? I'm not playing to my strengths. I, I need to go where I'm strong. So I'm strong. I'm a coach. So why not coach? 
when we when I made that turn and gave myself the freedom to just be the coach I am, I changed even the language of our organization. We no longer had committees, we had teams. We no longer had chairpersons, we had captains. You know, we I just went back to my terminology and my approach of getting people unified on a goal, focused on that mission, and, and let's go charge it together. And I think that was a big breakthrough for me. Another one was so I met a guy by the name of John Maxwell. And uh, <laughs> God brought John into my life, and uh, we hooked up early on. The guy's just been over 20 years now. Wow. And, uh, you know, being around John, this great leader that he is, a great writer he is. First time I met him and heard him, Doug, I bought every book, every tape. He had a hundred set cassette tape of it. <laughs> I bought everything. And I took them home and I listened to those puppy dogs. I was never in a car. I wouldn't listen to John Maxwell tape. And I'm going, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. He was reinforcing really all the core leadership fundamentals um, uh, for our lives. And, and that was a big turning point as well. And there's one more that I think was important for me. I realized when we early on, uh, I tried to be, quote, super pastor. I tried to do everything myself. And I realized, anyway, that's not how you do it. You've got to empower your team. So when I started empowering people more and realizing not only do I need to be out there producing, but I need to be reproducing. I, I've got to be sowing into my team members because here's what I know, Doug. To grow your organization, you have to grow your team. Hmm. If you don't grow the team, your organization is going to hit a lid. You know, John talks about the law of the lid and hitting that lid, you know. And, and typically leadership is, is uh, or the lack of development of leadership becomes that which creates the lid in any organization. So when it comes time for you to invest in, in, in leaders, period, what have you found the best ways to actually develop leaders are? Well, I, I think there's multiple ways. I think, first of all, you, you've got to take time to invest and build a relationship with those that you're trying to instill leadership in. I, I, want, to, I want to mentor. There's a mentorship. There's a coaching. There's exposing them to great materials. We challenge our staff to uh, have personal growth tracks, which involves uh, certain books we're going to read each month together, uh, down to getting them exposed to great champions. Uh, I'm bringing guys like John Maxwell, you know, in here to speak and coach our team up, taking our taking our team and exposing them to other successful organizations, uh, to other areas, to other great leaders. Uh, I learned that in my football days. You know, coaches are are just, you know, we're all the time out trying to learn from the other coaches. You know, we're going to coaching clinics. We're going to other practices. I always travel to the bigger schools with the better programs to learn from them. So we do that with our church team. We try to expose them to people that are down the road in whatever their expertise are so they can learn from them as well. So I think there's a multifaceted approach, but it's really, I think that the key to helping your team grow, Doug, is you got to keep yourself growing. Hmm. You know, I'm 73 years old and I go before my dissertation committee uh, or actually my the committee that would become my dissertation committee um, at Southeastern University. And they asked me the pointy question, why are you wanting to get a PhD at 73 years of age? I said, very simple, guys. I want to keep growing, and I want to serve as an example to my staff that you keep growing. Because here's what I believe, Doug. The day you stop growing yourself as a leader, you start losing the effectiveness to lead. And so if, if we're not learning, we eventually will stop leading. So that, that's kind of the model of my life that we, you, you lead by example. That's a big thing. So I think setting that example for your team and having that hunger to grow yourself in turn helps motivate your team to grow. And so, and I'm curious, so you've, you've had the opportunity to actually do life with some of the leaders that God is using in some of the most significant ways, including yourself on the planet. I would say Chris Hodges, John Maxwell's Christ Fellowship, have you noticed patterns or characteristics in leaders like yourself, John Maxwell, Chris Hodges, that what is it about them that allows God to use them in that way as you've been able to interact with them? Well, I, I think John would, would say that he is very intentional about the way he structures his life. Chris Hodges, Church of the Highlands, probably the fastest growing church in America, second largest church in America, second only to Life Church. Um, 
is the same way. He, Chris is a very focused, intentional, disciplined uh, uh, man. Uh, the way he structures his life uh, and his focus, and he's able to really uh, stay in his strength and uh, discern where he needs to invest his time for the greatest return. Uh, and he's had the ability to develop a great team around him. And I think that's the mark of all great leaders. Look at the team around them. Who are they attracting around them? And I think that, that really indicates uh, the quality of the leader. So I think the ability to build strong teams around you. You know, one thing as a coach, uh, I'm, I'm a recruiter. To be a successful coach, you got to be a great recruiter. And I think to be a great leader of an organization, you got to be a great recruiter. you got to recognize talent, potential, recruit that talent, and then help train that talent, empower that talent, get them on the field, and then become their number one cheerleader. See, I'm a big one on encouragement, affirmation, affirming people, the power of celebration in your organization. And um, I, I think that leads to success. And I think that you will find those traits in, in most of your top key leaders. So do you balance that with candor? Are you, all, are you more all encouragement or are you a pretty good mix of both? Candor? I think you have to be. I mean, you, you've got to deal with the, the issue straight on, you know, uh, with people. But you, you try to keep it in a, in a tone that is uh, effective and consistent. You know, uh, Maxwell said this years ago, and I believe with all my heart, that if someone's going to follow you, and especially in our world, as, as in the church leadership world, we have to lead not only staff members, but we have to lead tens of thousands of volunteers. It takes thousands of volunteers, leaders. Well, what, what prompts people to want to follow you in the first place or even be uh, really loyal and committed to you and to your leadership? And, and there's three, three things that, that John's talked about, and I, I've, I've written on it as well. The first thing is they, they've got to see that there's character and integrity in your life and that they can trust you. Mm -hmm. If people can't trust you, they won't follow you effectively. They may follow you because they're forced to because of a title or a position, but for them to follow you with their heart, they've got to trust you. They've got to know you're a person of character. Therefore, your consistency is essential in how you're reflecting that character and your action and reactions every day. The second thing is that they want to know that you're competent, that you actually have the skill set that is necessary to lead the organization and to lead them and to that there's value you can add to them and help them grow in, into their area of life or leadership or, or whatever it is within the organization. So that competence is an important thing. Keeping yourself and sharpening your skills, always improving yourself, always trying to grow yourself is absolutely essential. And then the third one is the compassion factor, that, that, that you're willing to connect to people at their point of need and add value to them because you truly care about them. So you think about it, Doug. You want to be around people that have true character, people that are competent and skillful, and people who really have compassion, who really care about you as a person. And when you, when you are able to work on those areas and be intentional in that with people, it stimulates a followership in them and a loyalty in their hearts. They want to be a part of your team. Yeah. Well, it's clear that you've done that over your leadership journey. And one thing I greatly admire about your journey is you've actually already been through succession. So you've handed off the baton to your, of your church to the next generation, your, your son and your daughter-in-law. And you've, that's gone really, really well. And I, I know a lot of pastors right now are in a season where they're either thinking transition, they're trying to execute a transition and a succession plan. I'll just leave this open-ended. What did you learn through the process and what would your advice be to those leaders and pastors who are thinking succession? Well, I think uh, if you've been a leader for any length of time, I think the organization, you, you have to always be thinking well ahead. Uh, I think that's what leaders do. We, we always are looking down the road. We're trying to plan, prepare uh, for the, the opportunities going to come our way in the future. One of the things I learned as a coach, that preparation is the key to victory. Uh, coaches are fanatical about preparation for games. And how much more should we be for preparation for our organizations for the future of them as well? So as I was looking at the church and its growth, I was always thinking about this, uh, this idea of succession. And to me, uh, there is no true success without an effective succession plan. 
I think the true legacy of any leader is going to be really manifested in how well they transitioned their leadership. How well did the organization they were leading do after they were no longer the, 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 the key leader in the organization? And if that organization, to me, uh, that one of my most fulfilling aspects of leadership is the fact that Christ Fellowship, since we passed the baton now, but approximately eight years ago, uh, is, is doubled in size, wow. it's growing, it's doing tremendously great. It's the old adage that as a leader, uh, I wanted my ceiling to be the floor for the next generation of leaders. So now they're taking it to the whole another level. And, and I'm their biggest cheerleader. I'm, I'm just cheering our team on. My son, Todd, his wife, Julie, our whole team has just done a phenomenal job in uh, taking this thing and going with it. But we, we actually had a transition plan, Doug, that we worked on for five years. Wow. I was thinking five years out and preparing for that and what that plan would look like, what I need to do to get uh, my, my successor, Todd, ramped up and ready to go. I, I kind of do it like a relay race. In a relay race, you're running, you have the exchange zone. And in that exchange zone, the, the, the runner's coming in there full speed. Well, I was at full speed. One thing I've learned, and I tell guys all the time, don't pass the baton when you're starting to slow down. Hmm, pass cool. the baton where you're still at full speed, where you still got a lot of run in you. That's when you pass it. You don't walk away from the game when you're worn out and injured. You know, you want to be at the top of your game when you pass the baton. So you got to hit the exchange zone at full speed. I had people tell me, Doug, well, what are you doing, Pastor? You still got all this energy and vitality and, and you're strong and you're, you, you know, boom, boom, boom. And, you know, I said, no, it's not about me. It's about when the one I'm going to pass the baton to is at full speed. When they're at full speed and I'm at full speed, that's when you want to pass the baton. So my goal was I knew I was running at full speed and still strong and still had some in me. So, but I wanted to get my, my successor up to full speed. So that was taught. So what did I need to do to get him up to full speed? I wanted to introduce him to my world. I wanted to help him grow. I wanted him to help grow in his weekend communication skills uh, because I was the primary communicator uh, in our church. So I had, to, I had to work him into that. I had to work him into other areas of leadership and exposure behind the scenes with the staff, with the boards, uh, with uh, our work with other churches, other partnerships. So we had a very intentional plan to get Todd up to full speed. And once he was up to full speed, boom, we made the pass. And, and, um, and now I'm cheering him on as he's running around the track. And the amazing thing I tell guys too is there is life beyond the pass of the baton. I think some guys think, well, if I step aside or I, I, I bring someone else up into my role, then what, what, what's for me there? Well, there's a lot waiting for us there hmm. because there's the opportunities to mentor and to encourage, uh, to write, uh, to support, uh, to be a part of helping other organizations grow and, and make their succession successful and their transition. So that was part of the key. I think it really comes down to a philosophy. Uh, I wrote a book on passing the leadership baton uh, that for anyone that's contemplating a succession, uh, it would be a great read for them because we talk about all the practical things you do to get yourself ready, to get your 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 team ready, uh, to get the whole organization ready, because you have to think the whole organization wide in order to have an effective succession. I love that. And I'm just curious, did you have a plan already for what you were going to do post-succession? Or you know, did you have a little blip where you had an identity crisis? Was there anything like that for you? Or was it a pretty smooth transition? You knew what your purpose was? Yeah, going it, was it was smooth for us because we had already thought through uh, those things and uh, uh, were prepared for that. But it can be a problem. I mean, some of the reasons guys hold on to the baton too long is because of that hesitation of, well, what is life going to look like afterwards? But see, here's another issue. You, you never leave something. You're always going to something. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm leaving this and, and all my identity is tied up there. My identity is really tied up in uh, the organization's success and, and, and my successor's success and the team, and as well as what I'm called to to do in that next phase of my life. So it's like people say, well, are you retired? I say, no, I'm not retired. I'm not <laughs> planning on retiring. 
I'm repositioning. Mm, so I'm good. repositioning myself to continue to be effective and to add value as I go. And I just have a clear curiosity. Clearly, you made the right decision with the, the success of the succession. Uh, but and, and it was a blessing, I'm sure, to have your actual family take over. Uh, but, but was there any thought of, do we need to do this externally, internally? And do you have any advice for leaders as they process that? I'm sure as a dad, like, people may want their kids to do it. I mean, do you have any advice well, when it comes to that? Well, I was fortunate. Uh, you know, I had a son like Todd who was more than able uh, and his, his gift mix and his passions aligned with the demands of this role. Um, if, 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 if you don't have flesh and blood to transition to, then you need to have, as I believe, spiritual sons mm. that you're developing, that you can that have the heart, the DNA, the culture, because as you know, all of that is critical to effective transitions in any organization. So I think that's where you have to plan and prepare. So I'm working with guys, helping them identify that and identify the traits that are needed uh, in the leaders that are going to step into and take the organization to its next level. And not everyone, uh, not every son or daughter is gifted in that way. Uh, So I think it's important that you don't force people into roles just because they are family and because you'd like to have them have the role. They have to, their gift mix has to fit that and their passion has to fit that. I would have never asked my son to step into the role he's in if he was not passionate about doing it and had the right gift mix to do it. So I think that's the challenge. So as we start to wrap up, just two fun questions. You're 73. Clearly you have a ton of energy and and fired up about life. I'm just curious, what are you dreaming about at 73 years old? What, What is just burning inside of your heart? Well, you know, that's, that's a great question. Um, I have a, a passion for, uh, the church. I have a passion uh, to see all that God is doing here through Christ Fellowship and, and the future of Christ Fellowship. is still, I wake up in the morning and I'm excited about what God is doing uh, here every day. I'm also very excited about uh, having the privilege now to be a spiritual father to a lot of sons in the gospel around the country and, and the, the other nations. Uh, I have the privilege to coach uh, a lot of young pastors and churches, and I love them, and I love coaching them. I love coming alongside of them and helping them and see them grow. Um, I have opportunities internationally right now to help the church at large internationally that I'm very excited about, Uh, and one of my favorite places in the world is Africa, and I've been leading a leadership movement in Africa for years for John Maxwell. Um, So we have a lot of things going on that, that excite me. Um, and there's things that are going on in our nation that right now that uh, opportunities we're having uh, for leadership and impact. But uh, that's kind of where I am right now. And I've got a couple books I'm working on as well. When I get this dissertation done, I'm going to jump into a couple books that I believe will help the church uh, grow and build a leadership culture within the church, because I think that is the number one need for churches to continue to grow and expand their ministry is they create an intentional leadership culture. So they are raising up emerging leaders and empowering them to go out and have impact with the love and message of Jesus Christ. Love it. Uh, just curious, are there any current coaches that are coaching currently uh, that you admire and, and really look up, maybe not look up to, but uh, really um, learn a lot from? And then maybe just one, who's your favorite coach all time? Oh, wow, man, that's tough. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Uh, there are so many guys out there I love. Uh, and, of course, you know, you have, you have the legendary guys. Everyone learned from Bear Bryant uh, the power of preparation. He was fanatical. Bear would prepare one hour for every minute of the game. Wow. So he had an average of 60 hours of preparation for that 60-minute game. And most, most of the coaches took that preparation intensity from him. Yeah, Belichick uh, at New England, that is just unbelievable. You know, and I've never been a New England fan, but I love the way that guy coaches. You know, um, I've, I've always grown up a big fan of Ohio State because I grew up in Ohio. Uh, Urban Meyer has gone through some rough, rough waters here recently, but he is a great coach. He wrote a book called Above the Line, which is really a great read. Uh, and I, this recent uh, thing going on with one of his staff members, I'm sorry that whole thing has happened, and I feel sorry for uh, the, the people involved in that. 
Uh, but there, there are a lot of great guys out there. You know, we, we all love Vince Lombardi. You know, he's, he's the legend. We all grew up loving him. Uh, so, you know, I, I love some of the older guys were uh, encouraging to me. But we got a lot of young coaches out there. They're doing a great job. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm actually a fan of so many teams. It's really funny because uh, – uh, and then we have guys from our church that are playing on several of the pro teams uh, that I'm rooting for. And uh, – are you, just about, are you a Pittsburgh? I'm from Pittsburgh. Are you a Steeler fan at all? You know what? I, I, I love the Steelers. I love them in their heyday when they were really just pounding everybody. And you, how do you not love Terry Bradshaw and the team? <laughs> of course, I met, you know, Tony Dungy's a great guy. I love Tony, a great guy, um, and some great football greats that we've, we've met through the years. But yeah, you know, I, and I, I grew up in Cincinnati, you know, north of Cincinnati. But, you know, I, it's really funny. I've never really been a crazy Bengals fan. I was a Browns fan because that was the only team we had back when I was there. And now the Browns, bless their hearts. <laughs> we need a moment of silent prayer for the Browns. Well, they, t- oh, they tied us last week, so uh, that, was, that was an interesting experience. Anyway. Yeah, they had a tie, right? Was, yep. the, tie? the Steelers, yep. Steelers and Bengals. Er, well, hey, Browns. that's not a loss. So that's <laughs> something for them, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, just as we close, anything you want to leave leaders with today? You know, I, I think just uh, – be a, be a person is always a person of integrity. Uh, be a person that's looking to add value in every situation. So it, it's uh, when you do that, when I found that when you're trying to add value, you will not have to worry about the value that you need added to your life. I think your focus is always, how do I make my team better and add value to my team? And if you'll do that and keep growing your team, it, it will help you to be successful in whatever you do. God bless. Uh, Thank you so much, and good luck on your paper. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to our interview with Coach Mullins. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you enjoy this podcast, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe and leave a rating and review. It helps us to grow our audience, and I would just appreciate it so much. So thank you in advance for that. You can find the notes from this episode, ways to connect with Coach, and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 206. On our website, you'll also be able to sign up for our email list to stay up to date with all of our current content and events and everything that we're doing here at L3. So I encourage you to sign up for that as well. I want to thank our sponsor, Alex Tulandon. Alex is a full-time realtor with Keller Williams Realty. And if you were looking to buy or sell a house in the Pittsburgh market, Alex is your guy. He's a member and a supporter of L3 Leadership, and he would love to have an opportunity to connect with you. You can learn more about Alex at pittsburghpropertyshowcase.com. I also want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. My wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers, and we just love them. They're an incredible organization, and they invest in couples, uh, both on the premarital side and once they get married. And we love that they invest beyond just selling jewelry. And so uh, if you're in need of a good jeweler, check them out at hennyjewelers.com. As always, I like to end with a quote, and I'll quote Dave Ramsey, one of my heroes today. He said this. He said, success is a pile of failure. You're just standing on top of it, not underneath it. I love that. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of L3 Leadership. Laura and I appreciate you so much, and we will talk to you next episode. 